yeah, I think I'll keep this angle for the, uh, for the author diaries. It, you know, it'll stand out from the rest of the stuff in the break room. Hey, everybody! So, yeah, I'm gonna keep talking about the book that I'm continuing to move forward with the goal of getting it published either by someone else or, more likely, by me uh, this year because I need to get it off my chest <laughs> and so I can start working on other stuff. So, Dreams of Fire. And this time, I'm gonna talk about character diversity. Uh, which has been on my mind a little bit lately. If you follow the main uh, Council of Geeks channel, at the time that I'm recording this, I, it was fairly recent that I put up my, uh, my video on woke entertainment. Um, so these sorts of things have been on my mind. And this is going to be less a sort of an imperative for like, this is what you should do if you're going to try and diversify your cast, and more just a log of how I approached diversity for my cast in this. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is I have been working on this book to some degree for about 18 years now. <laughs> so, you know, first conceptions, first sketches of the world, first scenes written about 17 years ago. I had my first finished draft um, about eight years ago, and I've been reworking it um, to varying degrees ever since. And the diversification of the cast was something that happened gradually over time. Because, and, and a lot of it having to do with my own sense of the world and perception and, and understanding of the value of that also evolving over time. So, like, original conception, um, had, well, <laughs> even before I put, I, I had a finished draft when I was first conceiving it, the character who is in most ways probably be considered the primary antagonist, um, a character by the name of Professor Draza Reigns. Uh, Professor Reigns is, uh, she works for the Science Guild. Um, I, I'll probably talk more about sort of organizations and world building at a later time, but she is, um, she is, not personally, actively, but she has dispatched uh, someone to be in pursuit of Ferris, who is the main character. Now, original conception, Professor Reigns was a man. And that wasn't with any intent, that was just kind of by default. And I've talked about this on the other channel, that unless you kind of go out of your way to alter your mindset, if you yourself are a, a, a cishet white man, which, even though I was cross-dressing back when I started um, writing this, was how I conceived myself, you tend to project that as your default template for characters. So, I changed that to make Professor Raines a woman um, by the time I actually sat down to write the first draft. So that was the first character that got altered in that way. But it happened uh, to a number of other characters over time. Very. At the time that I did my first draft, there was another character, originally written as a man, who I changed to be a woman. Um, and that is Arbiter Lorac. Now, Lorac is basically the head of what is effectively a city-state uh, called Torbeck, which is where the bulk of the narrative takes place. And Lorac is the highest authority in that area. Um, she actually describes herself as as the big fish in a small pond, but is also quick to remind other people that it's still her damn pond. So, and that was one of the first lines I ever wrote for that character, and it's still in the book. Um, but the reason that I ended up changing Lorac from a man to a woman was actually not out of a sense of wanting to, oh god, I need more women in this story, but more because when I sat back and actually, like, wrote out a full character list and the distinguishing features of the characters, I started to take a closer look of what this said about my world that I created. Because there were a number of things that I really, I basically did not want these things to be big deals in the world I was creating, even though they are kind of big deals here. Things like sexism, um, transphobia, racism, I wasn't trying to create a utopic society where, like, it's all perfect. I was just trying to more create a society that doesn't give a crap about any of this. So I, I didn't want any of that to be 
undercutting anything. Like, nobody questions Professor Raines' authority because she's a woman. That doesn't happen in the book, and that's very deliberate. But what I realized when I sat down was that if I, before I changed Lorac's gender, all the characters of notable authority, all the people of highest authority, were men. Because when I looked at, okay, what characters in here have power within this world? And I basically came up with four. Um, and at the top there was, there's a dean at the university, who's basically who um, Professor Raines answers to. There's Arbiter Lorac. There is the character of Tamalian, who is a business owner. Not exceptionally powerful, but he's basically the most powerful person within Torvec, person with the most influence within Torvec that we meet after the Arbiter. And there's also uh, a ship captain, um, you know, not as distinctly powerful, but obviously commander of his little world. And all four of them were men, originally. And what I realized is, that says something about my world that I didn't want to be the case. When 100% of the people with the most power, with the most ownership, and with the most control over their own individual little worlds were all men, whether intending to or not, I created a patriarchal society. And I didn't want that. So I, I went through and tried to figure out which characters I wanted to, because I decided immediately, like, these can't all be men. Like, the, this, this, this creates a background feature and a feel to the world that I do not want to be the case for the world I'm creating. So, when I tried to figure out who to change, I basically went through all of them. And I didn't change the ship captain, that's Captain Dreyard, just because it... He's a little bit tropey, but like he's fun and he's tropey in a way that is, that is masculinely tropey. And I was having too much fun with him, as is. Uh, Tamalian, I might talk about him specifically at a later date, but I've got kind of complicated reasons for not wanting to um, alter him. He's ba oh boy, I'll just say. Tamalian is basically one of two uh, author surrogates in the book. There's him and another character, and no, oftentimes when people say author surrogates, they're like, oh, the person's like, this is like me, and they're this awesome person. No, I, I base <laughs> My author surrogates are Tamalian and another character, and they basically represent one is how I would like to think I would behave in that sort of circumstance, and the other is how I think I actually would behave under that circumstance, or at least how I conceived of it at the time I first drafted the thing out about eight years ago. Um, so I, I've got kind of personal reasons for not wanting to um, mess with Tamalian too much, because there's a, there's a lot of not only me, but like me of a specific time, of about, you know, 18 to, to eight years ago, that range, in him as a character, and I kind of want to preserve that. Um, and then with the Dean, I didn't want to change the Dean to a woman largely because um, I liked how the gender dynamic impacted his interactions with um, with Professor Reigns. Not that they are particularly like sexually charged or anything, it just it said something about the way that he behaved around her that I think would have been somewhat diminished if if it was a woman. And so that landed me on the rack, which actually became a very obvious choice because there is no real benefit to the rack as a character being either a man or a woman. It actually didn't alter her dynamic with anybody substantially. And it also basically meant that the highest singular authority in the entire book would be a woman. And it's a position of power that nobody questions, and nobody challenges, and nobody mocks. So that went a long way to sort of easing my sense of like, oh, okay. It's not, it's not now an accidental patriarchy anymore. Okay, that helps. <clears throat> but again, I didn't go in intending to be like, must diversify this cast. It was, it was looking at the implications of the cast as I originally conceived them. That was another reason for one of the other gender changes, um, which was the character of Sergeant Harmon, who's part of the constabulary uh, within Torvec. And she was originally a man. And a bit like Lorac, it doesn't actually alter her interactions with anybody um, to change her from a man to a woman. 
And that was another case where when I stopped and thought about it, I kind of liked what it did to the dynamic of some of her interactions with some of the other characters to change her to a woman. It didn't severely rewrite anything, but th there was that. Now, of course, there's way more than just gender diversity to be concerned about. Now, when it comes to things like racial diversity, that that's tricky for someone who's as blindingly white as I am. Um, like, I, I'm... I'm relatives came over on the Mayflower white. That's how white I am. So, the, the thing is, I knew that I wanted a racially diverse cast, but I had to find a way to have that in there that would make me not uncomfortable to write about. Because to continually point out, hey, this person is is darker skinned than this person, it, it, it just makes me uncomfortable to put down on paper because it feels like I am, I, I'm just putting that front and center as like one of the first things you note about somebody. And again, where you're trying to write a world that, where this doesn't really matter to most people, Pointing it out continuously is kind of contradictory to that. So, while in my mind, a place like Torbeck is actually fairly racially diverse, there's really only um, one character that gets explicitly pointed out in the text as having darker skin, um, who is one of the primary supporting characters. That is uh, Matron uh, Branford, who heads the uh, the ward in Torbeck. It basically is like the the hospital. And th the way in which I was able to talk about her skin tone in a way that didn't make me feel completely uncomfortable was in having her place her hand um, on the hand of another character and pointing out that her skin was darker and stood out against theirs. I don't remember if I pointed it out anywhere other than that one. I also kind of, once I made the later decision to have illustrations, um, that also kind of freed me up a little bit because it meant that I could have it emphasized in the illustration. See? In case you missed it, look! Um, and I think that that's one of the things where, even though I'm writing a novel, my brain thinks mostly in movie terms, so I think visually. And in my mind, it's so much easier to just diversify your cast in a visual medium because you don't have to go out of your way to say that somebody is dark-skinned. They're just there. And you just see them. And that's it. And sort of having the illustrations actually allows me to have that be the case um, for that character at the very least, if nobody else. So that helped a bit. And there are other characters who, like, and again, I like wrote out um, of the list of named characters, and so there are other ones that, in my mind, are not as pale as I am, but it didn't feel right to explicitly state that for every single one of them, because, especially in some cases, they're not um, particularly significant outside of the one or two scenes in which they appear, and it would have felt really weird to highlight, hey, this character who you're not going to see again, hey, they're not white. Let's just be clear about that. Like, that feels, like, weird to me. Again, and that, and maybe it's okay and those are my hang-ups. I don't know. Uh, again, this is not a how-to. This is my process and how I've been doing this. So, the other thing is that I wanted to be sure to include um, was LGBTQ plus diversity. Now, romantic leanings don't really have a place in this book. There is no romantic interest in this book for anybody. And that was a directive in my mind going in, because for me, unless the story is about a romantic relationship or the romantic entanglement is thematically relevant to whatever it actually is about, I really hate romantic subplots. I'd say about 90% of the time they add nothing and shouldn't be there. So I didn't have one, and I never wanted one. It was planned without one. That's not to say that there are no romantic entanglements at all. There are a couple, but they're off to the side, and they're basically just referenced. So that actually made it quite difficult to establish LGBTQ plus diversity. Because 
what there is in the book. There is a bisexual character, an asexual character, a transgender character, and then uh, a number of characters for whom it never comes up and they could be literally anything. But the thing is, of those three that I mentioned that in my mind are definitely bisexual, asexual, transgender, only the transgender character gets specifically called out because, and this is sort of the backfiring of what I talked about, because I created a world in which none of these things are a big deal, it means that there isn't a reason to point it out in-universe. Um, specifically with the asexual character, which is actually a major character, I tried so hard to think of a way to make that explicitly clear about them. But I could, because of the scenes that character is in, and because of the ways and the instances and the motivations behind it, why they're interacting with other people, there is literally no reason for the topic of sexuality or who or whether they're interested in anyone to come up. I basically sort of crowbarred in one illusion that if you are looking closely you could realize is at least pointing to the possibility of them as asexual, but I couldn't find a way to make it explicit that felt in any way organic and natural. I just couldn't think of it. Now the transgender character that one is explicit, and it wasn't for a long time. And again, this kind of shows the evolution for how long I've been writing this. So that, that transgender character was actually always transgender from the first finished draft. Um, largely because my inspiration for that character um, was a transgender friend that I had. Um, mostly the inspiration for the visual appearance uh, of the character, and a little bit the personality, but definitely the look. So, they were always there and always like that. And yes, I'm using neutral pronouns because I don't want to give away in advance who it is. Because um, it does get made explicit. But that's sort of the thing. Initially, I had illusions and I had tiny little indicators that if you had the kind of mind that went there, maybe you could connect the dots. And that was my initial plan for them. But as things like... J.K. Rowling's continued proportion, you know, um, insisting that Dumbledore is gay without ever textually backing it up went on longer and longer and started to frustrate me. I realized, oh no, I can't just imply that. That matters too much to the... And, and unlike the asexuality, so like the asexual character, the fact that they are asexual doesn't actually have a ton of bearing on the story. I feel it is actually an important element of them as a person, but for the actions going on in the story and what they're doing and why, it doesn't really enter into it. With the transgender character, it actually does kind of impact their interactions and some of the things that they go through that are happening in story. And so it actually really did matter for me that I make it explicit, especially as I got older and got more and more frustrated with people who would hint but not actually say it. And the experience of doing that in this book sort of made me both sympathetic and frustrated to other creators. Because on the one hand, with my asexual character, I'm like, I get it. Sometimes because of what the character is doing and the circumstances that they're in, there is no way to bring it up that feels in any way normal and rational or organic. And I can sympathize with that. But if it actually does matter, if it affects their interactions and is an important part of who they are, uh, find a way, which is what I did with the transgender character. So I've actually kind of got both sides of that going on. Um, <clears throat> and that's pretty much where I wanted to, to talk about it primarily. There are other elements of diversity that exist within the world I created but don't come into play for this particular story. Things like religious diversity, because there are various religious orders and religious beliefs within this world, but none of them come into play into this particular story. So that wasn't something that really got integrated here. But I just wanted to sort of talk you through the very long-winded process by which I started with a initial concept that had pretty much all uh, cis white male characters with one female character at its initial conception to a draft that diversified some and then to revisions of that 
once I started to realize what does the lack of diversity say about the world? Okay, need to fix that. And is it important that this be explicit? In one case, no. In another case, yes. And sort of how I arrived at where I am now. Uh, and it's still funny that I continue to talk about this as if it's done and finished. I, I, I am now at this point of recording done what I do believe is going to be my final major revision on it. Uh, it still needs, you know, some editing, some tweaking, some cleaning up. But I think I'm done working on the structure and the shape of the story overall. I'm pretty sure I'm done with that. So I'm comfortable talking about it. So that's diversifying the cast of my book. Was this helpful at all? You find it interesting? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something on down in the comments and let's talk about it. Thanks for tuning in. I don't know when the next uh, author diary will go up, but I am going to keep doing them. So uh, come on back next time you need a break.